350 will be the song of uh, invitation this evening. Appreciate Brother Rudy leading us in our uh, song service tonight. If you have your sermon outline, our uh, supplement, you can open that up and you'll see the outline for tonight's uh, message. Uh, it reads a little different there on the title slide behind me. It just says Keys of Encouragement. Uh, the longer title there is on your outline, Keys to Congregational uh, encouragement. We're going to look at some things that you and I can do to encourage the body, the congregation uh, that we are a part of. Uh, let me remind you again, if you didn't get a chance to pick up one of these little cards for VBS, maybe you've got some folks that live in your neighborhood on your street. You can pick these up on the table right there in the lobby, uh, and you can uh, pass them out and invite their children to join us uh, Saturday, June 7th for our uh, one-day VBS program. It'll go from 9 to 12. Pizza and soda and desserts will be provided, along with a whole lot of good Bible uh, teaching. In 1938, uh, a young German Lutheran minister by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book called Life Together. Um, I, I do not, uh, it deals with um, Christian community. It deals with the encouragement that we have in coming together as brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't agree with all of Bonhoeffer's theology. I certainly don't agree with the plan of salvation that he taught. But I do agree with his assessment of how important life in a Christian community is. I think he was right. And he wrote this, this book after the seminary that he, was, uh, that he had attended was, was closed. And it reminded him of that Christian community that he had, that life together. It reminded him of how it was a wonderful time, a time of encouragement. And so he sat down and he uh, wrote this book. It didn't get translated in English till after his death. It, it got translated in 1954, maybe 1959, and it made its way to America. Uh, but Bonhoeffer was one of those people who did not survive the Nazi regi regime. On April 1943, the Gestapo showed up at his house. Uh, Bonhoeffer uh, preached against Nazism. He spoke out openly from his pulpit against Adolf Hitler and those uh, who were in support of him. And the Gestapo showed up at his house in 1943 and they arrested him. They took him and some other followers to uh, several different jails and prisons and eventually he wound up in a concentration camp. And when the Allied forces, specifically the 90th Regiment of the U.S. Cavalry, I believe it was, when they were approaching the concentration camp that he was being held at, they hung him. They were so scared of what his voice would be after the war that they wanted to silence it. And, and I think that's, that's tragic, of course, of how his life ended. But I, I think um, one of the lessons that we can take from that is here's a man, even in the darkest of moments in his life, uh, still held to what he understood as life in the community. He still, still held to his relationship with those who thought like him and loved like him and encouraged like he did. And I think that's an aspect, an attribute that we see in the Lord's Church today. Uh, those who come together who um, share a common belief as we do that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Those of us when we come together believing uh, that the church is the body of Christ. We come together believing that eternal life is real. That salvation is for all who, who desire it. We come together and we have a life in this community. And, and maybe we don't say it enough from the pulpit. I apologize but I'll say it now. We need your part in the community. We need you, what you bring to the body of Christ, what you bring to the community. We, we so desperately uh, need it. And time and time again in, in the pages of Scripture, uh, we're reminded of the importance of life in the community. Uh, life with other Christians, how encouraging it should be to come together. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 4, Paul says this in speaking to Timothy, I greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. He writes to Timothy, he says, I desire to see you. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about life in a community such as this, in the church. Let me give you a quote that Bonhoeffer wrote in, in this book. He said, the physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. I believe that. I believe it 
not just because Bonhoeffer wrote it. I think he's right. I believe it because that's the very thing that Paul is talking about there in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 4. I need you. Come to me. I want to see you. His words, I greatly desire to see you. That life in the community that we have. He goes on and he says these words, the believer feels no shame as though he were still living too much in the flesh when he yearns for the physical presence of other Christians. I'll say it again, he's right. That desire that we have to come together with brothers and sisters in Christ. Consider these words over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10 where Paul says this, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Paul saying again, I long to see you. I long to be in your presence. I long for us to be together. That's life together. That's life in this community of belief that we have. Let me give you one more. John, as he is growing older in his, his age and as um, all the other uh, apostles around him are dying and passing away and the church is facing just extreme persecution at the hand uh, of Rome. John writes these words and they express the desire of, of being with other Christians. He says this in writing his letter, having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. What is John saying? I want to be with you. I, I don't want to just write a letter to you. I, I want us to be together. I want us to be uh, uh, united. I want to be in your uh, presence. I want to see your face. Now that's not unique to John. It's the same thing that Paul was saying. It's the same thing that we see over and over again throughout the pages of Scripture. Turn over to Acts chapter 2. Turn over to Acts chapter 4. There is the church coming together in its infancy and saying what? We need to be together. We need the encouragement that we bring to the body of Christ, that we bring uh, to one another. That's the importance of congregational commitment. Other Christians need you. They need you. And together, certainly, we understand that we need uh, one another. The Bible goes on to describe in great detail life in the uh, community, life in the church. And I want you to go for just a moment, and I'll give you these keys in just a second, but I want you to notice uh, what Paul says about, about the importance of life in the church over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And if you'll turn over there, we'll begin in verse 12, and just a couple quick points here. Paul says, first of all, that it's important, this life that we have together in the body of Christ in this Christian community, because we understand that, that even though the one body has many parts as different members, we all need each other. And he does such a wonderful job here of describing in great detail the different members and how um, reliant they are on one another. And he says these words. He says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, all have been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, it is therefore not, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God, verse 18, but now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No. Much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and on our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body having given greater honor the part which lacks it, that there should be no schism, division, divide, gap, canyon, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. 
I, I think Paul's right. I know he's right because he's writing through inspiration, 2 Timothy uh, right, chapter 3 and verse 16. But I think he's dead on in, in showing us the importance of life in the body of Christ. Even though we're many members, we all need each other. The body is at its most effective state when the church is together. When, when, we're, when we're spread out, when we're not here, when we're not coming together as the body of Christ, we weaken ourselves. How? Because I need the part of the body that you are. And you need the part of the body that I am. And when we come together as the body of Christ, our life and community is better because we're operating at, at our strength, at our strongest. We're operating with all the talents and the abilities that everybody brings to their place in the body of Christ. Here's the second thing that Paul says. Stay right there in 1 Corinthians. In verse 26, he says that life in the community means that we suffer and rejoice together. And he says these words, And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Because we're united in the body, because we're one as the body of Christ, we can't help but suffer and rejoice together. Let me give you an easy explanation of this. If I smash my fingers with a hammer, right? It still affects my foot. <laughs> I guarantee you. If I cut my foot, it still affects my arms. The whole body suffers when one part suffers. Yet, if I get my foot fixed and it begins to feel better and it gets stronger, my whole body benefits from that. Or if my hand is injured and it begins to heal and it gets stronger, my whole body benefits. Why? Because even though it's individual members, that's a hand, that's a foot, that's an eye, that's an ear, it's all related together. It all forms one body. So if one part suffers, it all suffers. If one part rejoices, it all rejoices. This sounds odd, but we need one another's suffering just as much as we need one another's rejoicing. We do. We so desperately do. Why? Because that's life in the community. That's what we do as the body of Christ coming together because you're part of me and I'm part of you. We need all of those things working together. Let me give you another one. In verse 27, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul reminds us that together we'll always be the body of Christ. He says, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Right? The, the body, the church is not this building. It's a great building. I love our building. But it's not the church. If it blows away tomorrow, we haven't lost the church. I, I think we've done a good job with our Bible classes. I think we've done a good job with the fellowship area and, and the teacher resource room. But listen, if it went away tomorrow, we wouldn't lose the church. Why? Now you are the body of Christ and members individually because you are what comprises the body of Christ. Not brick and mortar or stone or concrete. Us as individuals make up the body of Christ. And so when we come together, wherever it may be, out in the field next to us, over at somebody's house, in a rented facility over here, out in some pasture somewhere, wherever we come together, now you are the body of Christ and members individually, where wherever we come together, there's the church of Christ. There we are. I think it highlights the importance of us being a people that assemble. Let me give you one more. You're in 1 Corinthians 12. Go all the way back to the first chapter. It's the understanding that's given to us that we need to be a united body. I, I haven't, I don't know the days that are allotted for me. You know, church, today could be my last day. And I never get to preach to you again. I never get to see you again. I never get to hug on your neck again. Today could be my last, this could be it. But in the time that I have had, I can say this with confidence. I, I've never had to, to, to worry about my body being at war with itself. I've never had my hand come to me and say, you know, Don, that foot sure is smelly. Get rid of it. Hasn't happened yet. I've never had the, my earlobe come to me and say, you know, look, Don, the earlobe is the most important part of the body. Why, without it, I mean, you can't do a multiple, multiple things. I mean, I'm just, I hold everything together. Why don't you get rid of the pinky? I don't see any point for the pinky. I've never had that type of war in my body. Yet when we look at the body of Christ, we have to be careful that the members don't end up warring with one another. That the members, the earlobe doesn't begin to say, do we really need the pinky? And that the foot doesn't begin to say, do we really need the eyebrows? 
We want to be united. And that's what Paul talks about. We need to be a united body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, he says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together, without lacking anything, perfectly, in harmony. That you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, Brethren, I have heard people, I have listened to sermons, I have read material where somebody says what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10 is not possible. I believe those individuals wrong. That it's not possible for us in life in the community to be of one mind, to be of one purpose, uh, to be united in the way that Paul is talking about. I totally reject that because I don't believe Paul is calling to us to that which is impossible. He's calling us to do that which is definitely able to be done. Now, I only know of one way for this to happen, verse 10, that we be perfectly united together in mind and in the same judgment. And I think the answer to it is at the very beginning of the verse when he says that you all speak the same thing. Well, the only way that I know that you and I can speak the same thing is if we have the same source, the Word of God. The Word of God, which is truth. John chapter 8 and verse 32. John chapter 17 and verse 17. The word of God, which is powerful and uh, uh, which is um, uh, the, the uh, powerful unto salvation, Romans chapter one and verse six. The word of God that is inspired by the Holy Spirit, Second Timothy chapter three sixteen. Why? Well, that's the only way that I know you and I can speak the same thing is if we're speaking from the same source. You see, we need to be a people of the Bible. A people come together and say, not what do I think or what do you think? What does God's word say? Now, why does that matter? Well, because unity is what we're after. Unity is what we need when we talk about life in the community. All of us coming together, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. All of us coming together with different personalities, different likes, different dislikes, different joys, hopes, dreams, pain, sorrow, difficulties, whatever it may be, all coming together and yet we can be united. Yet we can be one body that is functioning together just as God designed it. Isn't that what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Work your way down from verse 12 all the way to verse 25. Now God has put the members in the body just as he desired. Knowing what the body needs. I think those, those things, what is that, four? I think those four things highlight the importance of life in, in the community. As members of a congregation, we each need to do our part. We can't do our part if we don't honor if we don't honor the assembling together. I'll say it again, we need one another. That's why it's so important that all the body, all the parts be together. Well, knowing all that, how can we as individuals do our part to encourage the body? Again, I'll say it, I think what, what, what Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes is, is right. I think he's, he's, he's got it when he says, listen, the physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. What can we do as individuals to encourage that type of belief in our other members and other followers of Christ? What can we do? Well, I want to offer to you five keys. By, by keys there, I give you a little definition underneath your introduction. Um, you just think of a key that unlocks a, a lock. I, I think that's fair, but we're talking about a key here in the sense of that which affords a means of access. How can I access encouragement? How can I be one that presents a key of encouragement in the body of Christ? I'll give you a couple tonight. The first one is this. We can encourage the congregation that we're a part of by first of all being faithful in our attendance. Now you knew that was coming, right? You knew that was something that we stress here as being vital to us in the body of Christ. Let me give you just a, a couple quick verses. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. The purpose of us coming together, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, I, I know that the brotherhood is all, all kinds of different ways when it se sees that word, the day approaching. I've read all kinds of things. I'll throw out my understanding to it. The, there's only one day that I can see approaching. I don't know when the second coming is going to happen. And certainly when Paul wrote these words 2,000 years ago, he obviously didn't see the second coming happen. 
the judgment happening. It hadn't happened. I think he's talking about the first day of the week assembly. As you see the day approaching, that's the day that I can see. And so, listen, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner, the habit of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching, the body of Christ having the opportunity to come together, to be together, and to be the church, and to encourage and uplift and support and teach one another. You see the importance of the church coming together everywhere. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Paul assembling on the first day of the week uh, with the church. You see it also over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. I know the context is Paul talking about a collection that's going to be made. I get it. But notice what he says about the church coming together. He says on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Well, Brother Gellis, he's talking about a collection. Yeah, he is talking about a collection, but in the midst of that, he's talking about the church assembling together. So much so that he can write a letter and say, listen, I know you're going to come together as the body of Christ. I know that you're going to be together. We know that they're worshiping on the first day of the week. And he says, listen, since you're coming together, I want you to take up a collection so that when I get there, I can take that collection back and it can be used. Well, Paul wasn't talking about arriving there in Corinth and then going to everybody's house individually, was he? Well, no. Why? Because the church was going to come together. And they were going to be in one place. And Paul could assemble with that body of Christ. That's talking about being faithful in attendance. So much so that Paul could say that I know you can take up a collection because I know you're going to be together. The same thing he said to the Corinthians, even though he didn't praise them for their actions in the Lord's Supper. How many times does he say in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you know, when you come together, episun agoge, when you come together, when you come together, when you come together, when you come together, when, it's expected that we're going to come together. When we don't come together, when we don't do our part to assemble, we're doing the very opposite of what the scripture is encouraging us to do. So what is one of those keys of encouragement that I can give to the congregation? I can be in the midst of the assembly. I can be with my brothers and sisters in Christ when they assemble together. What does it teach the body of Christ? What does it teach your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ when softball is more important or this activity is more important or this thing over here is more important? What does it teach us in the body? It certainly doesn't encourage us, does it? It certainly doesn't encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ who are part of that body that you're a part of when you say, you know what, there's something else that's more important to me, so I'm not going to assemble with you. First key of congregational encouragement, be here. Be here. Here's the second one. We can encourage the congregation that we're part of by loving it and forgiving. Go over to Ephesians chapter 4. I, I don't think any of these verses are going to surprise you. Uh, Paul says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. We need forgiveness. We need it. I, I need it. You need it. We all need it. Why? Because we understand that, that there are a multitude of different ways that we blow it. That we don't live up to being the person that we know we can be. Or that we don't do that which we know we ought to be doing. Or we act in a way that we shouldn't. Or we do what we shouldn't do. Or we say what we shouldn't say. We need the forgiveness that comes from being part of this community. We need the forgiveness and the love that we can have by knowing that when we assemble together as the body of Christ, we'll find it. That it'll be present among us. Peter says these words over in 1 Peter chapter 4 and down in verse 8. He says, above all things have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. My love for the brethren isn't always fervent. Sometimes it's frustrating. I, I know. Maybe you feel the same way from time to time. But you know what? I couldn't make it without the body of Christ. I, I'm still young enough, and, and uh, have not have. Uh, I, I, I can, I'm still young enough to remember what life outside of the body was like. I remember. I remember what it was like not being part of the community of Christ. I don't want to go back to it. It's not for me. So I'm thankful that I can come together, that you and I can come together into a congregation in which we know we'll find that love and that forgiveness. That doesn't mean that we'll find acceptance for that which is error. Or that we'll find our brothers and sisters in Christ not having a care and concern for us and they turn and look the other way when they know that we're doing wrong. We're not talking about that. 
But when that repentance is there, when that desire to be part of the body is there, when that willingness to conform to the word of God instead of to the will of the world, we know that the body is going to be there to love and forgive us. Well, that's something that we can do to encourage the body that we're part of. Love those around us. Forgive those around us. Let me give you a third, a third key. We can encourage the congregation by praying uh, for one another. You hear me say it all the time, and I'll say it in just a few minutes at the invitation that we're a praying church. We are. We're a praying church. I, I, I can't tell you everything that goes on behind the scenes because some of it is confidential, but I can tell you this, that when the elders assemble right over here in the conference room, they pray for you all. They, they mention you by name. They pray for you. They mention your need, your problem, your joy, the struggle, whatever. They, they lift you up in prayer. Don't we want that? To know that there are other brothers and sisters in Christ saying our name to God's ears. Why would you bless sister so and so? I know brother so-and-so is dealing with such a terrible situation right now. W would you please comfort him? I know that something wonderful is happening with this family. I'm just excited and I want to rejoice with them. But to know that other brothers and sisters in Christ that are part of us as the body of Christ are mentioning our name specifically to God, I, the hair on the back of my neck raises up. That you would take the time to mention my name to God. Thank you. We ought to be doing that for one another. Paul goes on, he says these words in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 16. He says, do not, cease, uh, do not cease to give thanks for you, Paul, making mention of you in my prayers. What is, I pray for you all the time, Paul is saying. I never stop. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, same thing. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. What? Pray for one another, whatever it may be. I, I'm a firm believer in what I, um, I, I guess you can call it a, a, a multitude of things. Unknown prayer requests, I guess, is what most people say. I have no problem with somebody saying, Brother Don, I've got a situation or whatever. Um, I, I, would you just pray for me? I believe that God is big enough to know who you are and what you need. And I have no problem saying, you know what? This, this sister or this brother, they've got, a, they've got a need, Father, and I just want to mention them to you and, and what you know that need is. I'm okay with that. I'm all right with it. But the idea that with all prayer and supplication, that with perseverance, that we make mention of the needs of all the saints. You know, we have a prayer list on our bulletin. And uh, what a wonderful thing. It's made in one corner for a reason. I used to have it in the middle. Now it's on the outside because I found that some of you just like to cut that little corner off and stick it right on your refrigerator. Why? So you can always remember those individuals. Thank you. I think that gives encouragement to the congregation. Let me give you a fourth key. Fourth key, we can encourage the body that we're part of when we help, or help to carry the workload. There's a lot of work to be done. A lot of work. It would amaze you what took place this week for this service to happen. It just didn't fall together. It, it, would, you, it would amaze you to see what happens throughout the week, Monday all the way to Saturday, to make all of this happen. Everything that goes into the service, I mean time and, and attention and prayer is, is given to us coming together. There's a lot of work that takes place that needs to be done. That's just in worship. Somebody preparing the communion trays. Somebody in here cleaning the pews so that you can have a, a nice place to sit down. People doing maintenance on the building so it's not falling apart. People preparing and fixing the song books when they need to be uh, taken care of. Uh, uh, Bible classes being prepared by teachers. Uh, teachers coming in, decorating the rooms. There's a lot of work that takes place around here. And we all need to do our part to encourage the congregation by helping to carry that workload. Do you remember the story over in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 12? Uh, Moses is tired. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's happening. And, and God has given him a command that he hold his hands up. And there in verse 17, the honesty of the scriptures come through. 
Just the, the blatant honesty. And it says this, but Moses' hands became heavy. It's true. He's tired. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Moses was weary. He was tired. What happens? Aaron and Hur come by and say, look, we'll share the workload, and we'll hold your hands up for you. We'll do it together. Brethren, the body of Christ here at Northwest needs you to help hold up its hands. It needs you to help carry the workload. I know you, some of you are just worn out. I know it. I know some of you have been laboring in the kingdom for longer than I've been alive. I know it. I understand it. But listen, we still need workers. We still need people who are willing to hold up the hands of this congregation so that the work can be done. Go over to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, and notice those words there in, in uh, verse, uh, verse 2. Not Galatians 6 and 2. Is that right? Yeah, Galatians chapter... I'm in Galatians 6 and verse 18, which is a great verse, by the way. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. There's more work that we could do if we had more workers. There's more pews that could be filled tonight if we had more workers. There's more people who could come to know the blessings in Christ that you know and enjoy if we had more workers. And I think one of the things when we talk about encouraging the congregation, the understanding that am I doing all that I can to help carry the workload? Listen, church, when we have to call and beg and beg people to work, that doesn't strengthen the body. When we have to call people on the phone and plead with individuals to please help with VBS, to please help with this event, to please help with this class. It wearies the body. It doesn't strengthen it. If there's one thing, especially smaller congregations need, it's more folks stepping up and saying, you know what, I'll hold your hands. I'll help lift them up. And you know what, we'll do this work together. You want to encourage the congregation that you're part of? Consider helping with the workload. Consider helping supporting those who are doing the work. Let me give you one more. Keys to congregational encouragement. Be faithful in your attendance. Love and forgive. Pray for one another. Help to carry the workload. And here's the final one. Be one who is willing to seek out straying members. We touched on this a, a, a while ago. You can go over to James chapter 5 and verse 19. We touched on this a while ago, but all of our pews are not empty because people moved away. All of these pews are not empty because uh, people are sick tonight or working tonight or traveling tonight. Brethren, some of these pews are empty tonight because brethren who were once sound and faithful aren't. They've strayed. And what they so desperately need is for us as the body of Christ that loves them as a member, as part of this body, to go out and get them. To go out and find them. To go out and encourage them. James says this in chapter 5, verse 19, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save the soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. We've talked about it. I won't go into it in great detail, but he's talking to Christians. And he clearly identifies here in, in verse 20 Christians as being those who can sin. Because there's this concept out there that once you're a Christian, you don't sin. Not true. Brethren, if anyone among you among you wanders from the truth. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way. The sinner is equated with those who have wandered away, who were brothers and sisters in Christ, brethren. So we can see, what can I do to encourage the congregation? Listen, I can make an effort to go out and to get those who have strayed away. 
who have fallen into a state where they're not attending or not coming or not even believing anymore, whatever their situation may be, I can go to them and seek to do my part to bring them back. Why? Because the body is always stronger when all of its members are together. The body is always its strongest when the membership is showing that care and that concern uh, one uh, for another. It's what we so desperately need as the body of Christ. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. I wonder why James chapter 5, Galatians chapter 6, I wonder why it is that so much importance is given to going out and finding those who have strayed away. Well, because it's a soul. Oh, preacher, you're not fooling us. You're talking about numbers. I'm not talking about numbers. The elders don't base whether or not, you know, we're sound or faithful based on our numbers. We're talking about souls. We're talking about individuals who have placed themselves in a very, very dangerous situation of having Jesus Christ return and them not being found faithful. Because we love them, we ought to go to them. And because we love their soul, we ought to be willing to help bear that burden, teach them whatever the situation may be, whatever the problem or the difficulty may be, to help bring them back into that right relationship with God. That's how we can encourage a congregation. If you think about those who have wandered away from the truth who aren't with us tonight, um, imagine what this service would be like right now with them swelling our ranks, singing with us, praying with us, worshiping alongside of us. Imagine what it would be like. Brethren, if the day comes and I'm not here, would you come get me? If the day comes and you hear that Brother Gellis has turned away from the gospel of truth and has embraced error, would you please love me, love me enough to come get me? I hope so. I'll do the same for you. I say this there at the bottom of your outline. When we talk about the entirety of all of this being together in the body of Christ and the congregational encouragement, The question is a personal one. Are you an encouragement to this congregation? I don't answer it for you. You don't answer it for me. But I think it's a question that we all need to ask. Are are we an encouragement to the body that we're part of? Are we doing what we can to help support the body that we're a part of? Do we love the body enough? I love my foot. I love my hand. I love my earlobe. I even love my eyebrows. And they just take, they just go crazy. I'm, I can comb them up over the top of my forehead. I, I, but I still love them. I love them. Do we love one another that much too? Do we have that care and concern and that love for one another that we want to do all that we can to encourage the body that we are a part of? I would never let my foot mock my hand or I'd never let my hand say that I don't need, we don't need the elbow. Well, we ought not to do that as the body of Christ. Are you an encouragement? I'll suggest to you that these five things can at least get you started thinking in that direction. And my prayer is that you would consider ways, even if you are encouraging, ways that you can encourage even more. I know God loves us. I've read the scripture. I know God loves us. But I want us to love one another. And when we encourage one another and we encourage the congregation that we're part of, we show a love for one another. Let's do that. We're going to be led in our song of encouragement, but Brother Rudy, if you are here and and we can pray for you, we'd love to do that. If you're here tonight and you're not a member of the church and you've heard me talk about this community and you've heard me say things about the body of Christ and you've heard me talk about being a member, being a part of the body of Christ and you've been wondering about that, it's no secret. It's no secret. One becomes a a part of the body of Christ by being added by God himself. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. How how does that incur? Uh, Well, it, it occurs when one is faithful to the gospel plan of salvation, to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized. 
And if you would want to be part of the community of Christ, if you want to be part of the body of Christ, if you want to know that salvation is yours, forgiveness can be had, we'd love to rejoice with you as you become a Christian tonight. How can we help you? Well, if you're subject to the invitation, why don't you come forward as we stand and sing. I don't have the invitation slide. 905? 948. 948. 948.